The ten northern tribes of Israel are scattered. The southern tribes are taken captive by the Babylonians. And the beautiful temple of God, along with the glories of Jerusalem, are destroyed. Is this the end of the once mighty children of Israel? Okay, we all know the Old Testament can be very confusing, with the second half of its books completely out of order chronologically, and many of them happening at the same time, telling the same stories. The two books, Ezra and Nehemiah, used to be one book, and are actually last in chronological order, covering 538 BC to 400 BC. Remember, before Christ, the dates went backwards, which can be even more confusing. <sighs> Don't worry, we'll help you keep it all straight. So, the Persians, who defeated the Babylonians, are the new Middle Eastern superpower. Remarkably, the Persians have many kings with humble, teachable hearts. And, though they don't personally believe in Jehovah, they're cool with allowing the captive Jews to return to Jerusalem, rebuild their temple, and worship the way they want. However, the ten northern tribes still remain lost and scattered. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, all Persian-born Jews, are individually sent by various Persian kings to lead this return of the Jews and their rebuilding effort in Jerusalem, as retold in these two books. Zerubbabel leads the first group back to Jerusalem and starts rebuilding the temple. Unfortunately, not many Jews are eager to return and work. I mean, life has gotten pretty sweet in Babylon, and especially the younger Jews are having a hard time bidding it farewell because they've forgotten their covenants and know not the God of Israel. So most of them are content to stay in their new land of comfort instead of returning to rebuild a temple and make covenants. Now even today, it's hard to leave comfortable places, but we know God's blessings and power come when we leave the comfort zone and go to the temple. Now the older generation remembers the temple and its real importance and are excited to return. The first thing they do is rebuild the altar and offer daily temple sacrifices for the first time in many years. Eventually though, the initial excitement wears off. Adversity grows and things slow to a stop. One of the biggest problems is that many outsiders, namely Samaritans, want to help build the temple but are excluded and shunned, and so begin fighting against it, fueled by the same adversary who still tries to stop us from doing temple work today. So the Lord sends two great prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, to prophesy about the importance of finishing the house of the Lord. And as they put their whole hearts into the rebuilding, God blesses them with speed, and the temple is completed in 516 BC exactly 70 years after it was destroyed. This second temple, or the Temple of Zerubbabel, doesn't compare to the splendor of Solomon's temple, since the people are so poor. It also doesn't contain the Ark of the Covenant because it went missing during captivity. And no, Indiana Jones didn't find it. But this temple stands for over 500 years and is the same temple that King Herod later rebuilt, twice as big, at the time of Jesus. Now, on Ezra's first trip to Jerusalem, three generations after Zerubbabel, his entourage is carrying loads of shekels in gold, silver, and precious items, so it doesn't look so poor. Unfortunately, the path they have to travel is filled with thieves, and Ezra, who'd just told the Persian king how supremely powerful his god is, doesn't feel like now's the right time to request earthly guards en route. So, Ezra and his group fast and pray with their whole hearts for God's protection of their large caravan. And thankfully, despite the perilousness of their journey, their powerful faith in God enables them to travel and arrive safely, witnessing to us that as we trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not unto our own understanding, He shall direct our paths. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah all faced many challenges in Jerusalem while teaching the people the Law of Moses and rebuilding the Temple. However, several of their problems happened because they excluded so many people. 
Many who offered to help build the temple were excluded. Those who married outside of the covenant were excluded. And those who stayed behind in Jerusalem and now called Samaritans were excluded. Now, while God uses the scattering of Israel to bless all nations of the earth, He never intended for Israel to remain scattered. And we've covenanted to gather Israel today. As we do, we can learn from these Old Testament examples and remember that the gospel of Jesus Christ includes people of all kinds, as we are all alike unto God. Today, our leaders teach us to love and welcome everyone to join us. Let's show love to everyone, even those in shabby clothes, or who smell funny, or speak a different way, or have green hair, or whatever. They're still welcome. They are God's children. He loves them, and we, His disciples, do too. And while leaving the comfort zone is a struggle for some, <clears throat> with His help, we can pray for a new heart to see through God's eyes. We don't shun Samaritans, but seek to learn from the Good Samaritan and cross the street to welcome, lift, comfort, and help all of God's children. Next time, we learn about the amazing Esther. It takes a lot to make these videos, so to keep Line Upon Line free for everyone, consider donating through Patreon. The link's in the description below. And thanks for watching. This episode is packed with info, so you might want to watch it again to make sure you didn't miss anything, including the hilarious jokes. If you feel this video has helped you on your path towards truth and Christian discipleship, please subscribe and share. Most importantly, go read the scriptures for yourself.